Welcome to the Rise to the Challenge podcast. Joined today, he's the CEO and founder of True Zenith Creative. It's Jack Christensen. How are you doing today, Jack? I am fantastic, man. That was uh, that was an intro. Thank you. <laughs> We're so excited to have you on the show to talk about your rise to the challenge. What we like to do with all of our guests is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what you like doing growing up. For sure. So I'm from a town called St. Cloud, Minnesota, smallish, about maybe 250,000 people. Um, and well, let's start when I was, I've, I mean, I grew up outside, right? I was an outside 90s kid. I was born in 93, so I'm 29 years old. Um, and I grew up playing outside, not really too much video games. Um, but we'll fast forward a little bit till I was nine years old. So when I was nine years old is kind of when I first started my first entrepreneurial journey, if you could call that, call it that. Um, I started making cookies. Uh, so when I got home from school one day, I start, just started making cookies and then selling them uh, door to door. Um, but growing up, I've always, I always had, a, I had some struggles because, so I, I don't know what you call it or whatever. I don't really care about labels, but I was diagnosed with Asperger's right around when I was, I don't know, eight or nine years old, something like that. And so I was, I had a rough time with my parents always fighting and things like that. And um, up, up through my high school years, I would say it made my life tough in, in that regard. But honestly, I, um, those same kind of things have been blessings in the adult world. So I actually don't find it a struggle, maybe a struggle as a kid, but it, the same things that were a struggle as a kid made it better, like as, as an adult. So, um, but yeah, so I started selling cookies when I was nine years old, door to door. Um, that went well, made some good money. Um, I had a couple orders that were like 500 plus dollars for like reunions and stuff. As a nine year old, that's good money, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, uh, so then next business adventure was um, selling jewelry. And I actually talk about the story on a, another one of my podcasts. Um, when I was 12, I took my first business loan. And uh, he's also my first mentor. And it's actually the reason I have Two Zenith Creative now. Um, he owned an advertising agency in St. Cloud and he gave me a loan to, um, to start selling jewelry, to have a jewelry show. Like I made like a, you know, a Swarovski crystals, handmade jewelry. Um, but ever since then, um, I've always wanted to own an advertising agency or a creative agency. And so, uh, but it wasn't until I was, you know, about a year ago, so until when I was 28 that I, that I finally made that happen. Um, so growing up, um, my biggest struggles were school, right? Like I was always really embarrassed that I was like in the special needs classes or whatever and had the, I always made sure the teacher had the doors closed and stuff. And I was looking back, I was bullied, but I don't, I didn't really care. Like mm -hmm. I just, it just never bothered me. Same thing. Like I'm just weird. My parents were divorced when I was 12 years old and it just didn't like, they sat me and my brother down and they were just like, yeah, so we're getting divorced. And I was like, okay, can I go play with Legos? Like, I just, <laughs> it just, I didn't, it didn't, at least I don't remember it bothering me in any capacity. So I think that, I think that's the Asperger's, which again, made me weird to other kids, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it's just made me not give a fuck what other people think about me. <laughs> <laughs> With the two different businesses you had with the cookies, well, first, the important question is what type of cookies were you selling? Only oatmeal chocolate chip cookies. It's the only cookies I made. Interesting. Why only oatmeal? Oh, well, especially because, oatmeal. Well, okay. So you wouldn't know there's oatmeal in it. So because we would, I would grind the oatmeal up in a blender. Okay. But it came from a recipe that was in our local newspaper once and my mom always used to make them. And they, everyone loved them, especially when they were, um, hot and fresh because I would literally take them, bake them, and then bring them to the orders hot mm. and fresh with like handwritten note inside saying thank you for two dollars and ninety nine cents. Like what? Who's gonna say no? <laughs> <laughs> See, the only type of oatmeal ones I like are the iced oatmeals, which iced oatmeal. So it's like the oatmeal cookie, and then it has looks like vanilla frosting on the front part okay. of it. The only time I buy them is at like a grocery store, and right. Like Walmart has them, the local grocery stores, but they're so good, but it's the only oatmeal ones. And then as I got older, then I started doing like the oatmeal chocolate chip and stuff. And I'm uh, like, okay. oh, but did you prefer doing the food business or the jewelry business? Cause those are definitely two different kinds of concepts. 
I enjoy making money. Hey, um, that's a good answer. <laughs> I would say jewelry, maybe I like a little more because I was always into art. So I also did a ton of pottery. Um, I was one of only a handful of kids to get a uh, five out of five on my APR portfolio for ceramics um, in the in the nation. And so uh, I started doing pottery when I was 10 and I did that all the way through till I was like 21. Um, in fact, that's actually what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be a professional potter for like, I was super into it, man. I mean, I, I did it. I have well over 10,000 hours behind a wheel throwing it and I can still sit down and throw. Um, I actually did it because um, my dad just basically made me realize it's, uh, you know, you can't make enough money at that. Although I think I could have, because with the knowledge about how we can sell online and everything, I think I actually could crush it as a buyer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, there's a reality that most people who do ceramics for a living, you know, aren't going to have, you're not taking vacations every year or anything like that, you know. Looking for, um, oh, sorry. No, no, that's it. As you're an owner of a company now, do you feel that starting your own business at a young age has given you the tools and helps you learn about the hard work it takes and things like that to no. Really... no. No. What what taught me about what taught me about hard work has nothing to do with the kid. I had a pretty freaking amazing life as a kid. You grew up in an upper middle class family. Uh, we took tri trips to Hawaii and stuff. Um, I had a pretty easy childhood in that regard. Um, what taught me about overcoming adverse adversity has things to do with after like uh, for example I was homeless I've been homeless twice kind of three times but for sure twice um so I've made some stupid decisions um I have well the, a gross misdemeanor is on my record but it was charged as a felon um the first time I had a, any issues with the law I was 20 20 is 20 21 something like that um, and I stole about $5,000 worth of Magic the Gathering cards. If you know what those are, nerdy little stupid game. But the, the amount means it's a felony. And so um, that was the first time I had any issue with the law. But again, I, it, it wasn't really that much of a hardship at the time because uh, my cousin was a lawyer and uh, he knew someone that could help me with my case. I still had to find the money to pay. Although that's something that I've always been good at because I found a, a, a wealthy like doctor in the area who helped give me the money to, to fight my case. Right. And so long story short, it gets up to a misdemeanor plead out and I pay the restitution. Um, but because of all these things that kept happening and because and the things that kept happening were 100% my own fault, right? Of course, my family is going to get fed up with me. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, and I've always been someone that didn't want to work for people. And then once you get that on your record, it's much harder to find jobs, especially for theft. Right. And so, um, there were two times that I was homeless, um, not homeless. Like you think of a drug addict on the side of the road, homeless. Cause like, I still had work ethic, but living in a car, like the first time I was homeless, I was in California. Um, I would, and this was a good homeless, I would say, this is what I refer to my good homeless years. So I was living in a car in California. It was a Honda Civic. I'm six foot three. So <laughs> a tiny little car, right? But I chose to live in a car because I was moving from Minnesota with like $500 to my name, mm -hmm. moving from Minnesota to California. And I was like, I just want to be here. I was really into fitness at the time. That's where Arnold Schwarzenegger like trained all that kind of stuff. Right. And so that's an interesting thing about, I think, mindset, because I was living in a car, but I was the hap one of the happiest times of my life, living in a tiny little car out there. I started, I found a job. I became a manager of a supplement store out in Southern California I called, oh shoot, what was I called? Um, it was in Los Alamitos uh, in Long Beach, but I can't remember, New NutriShop. NutriShop. I was a manager of a NutriShop and um, I was living in my car. And I, mean, I remember one day in my car, I parked my car a little too far, like into someone's driveway, got towed and I had to walk seven miles to work. But, and I got there and my boss was like, why didn't you call me to pick you up? I was like, yeah, cause it was only my second day, you know? And so um, it's just like I, that, I, I'm now sitting back here with my business and in a, having, you know, a nice house, all that stuff. It's easy to say, man, I wish I would have thought about the, 
the next time in my life that I would be homeless because the, the next time it just made me depressed. But at that time, I was just happy to be somewhere new and trying to build something. And that's it. I didn't care about girls. I didn't care about, um, I didn't care about money. I just was happy to be in a new place, work out and, and try to figure out a way to, to make my life better. So I think that sometimes if you can just change your mindset, because even if you're homeless in today's world, man, we still have it better than a lot of Kings did from 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. If you can just like tell yourself it's all going to be okay. And like then work to figure it out. You can be pretty happy in any situation. You talked about being a professional ceramic um, artist. Or I wouldn't say professional because I was or yeah. like, a, a, like in the arts space, yes. like in yes. the art industry. Did that play effect in college or did you go right into the workforce after like high school? I did some college into, well, so the reason I went, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go to Japan and study pottery under, cause that's what my master potter had done. And he had the connections for me to go do the same. Um, but my dad basically put an ixnay on that. Um, so I did go to college. Uh, the first college I went to was like a for-profit business school. Mm -hmm. Um, and I went for graphic design. I think I did about a year, just under a year, something like that there. Um, and then I went into the workforce. I can't remember. Well, I was working wise in college. I, I was working at Target in the, I was working overnights in the deli at Target. But when I quit there, or when I, when I dropped out of school there, I don't remember what I did. I have no idea what my job was. <laughs> Maybe that was the first time I worked in cell phone sales. I honestly, I can't remember. I, I really, I, I can't remember what I did. Yeah, I have no idea. So I, I dropped out of school there. Oh, no idea what I did. I, anyway, I, so it was about another, maybe eight months in between because I didn't finish quite a year there. And then the next fall, I went to actual university, but again, only went for about a year and I was going for economics. Um, and then at that point is when I dropped out of there um, and I was doing cell phone sales, um, working for Sprint. I became a manager of a store. And then I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm still in my same town. I grew up in, had about $500 in my account, maybe 600 and took my car and drove to California. Um, for, oh, oh, and the first time I ever set foot in a casino, I forgot about this. First time I ever set foot <laughs> in a casino it was on my way there. I had like five, $600 and I, proceed to lose two hundred dollars in blackjack. Oh good. <laughs> on the way to California. So there's that. Was it in uh, oh, Nevada? Like did you stop which casino? Yeah, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh and I was such an asshole. I forgot about this. I had a girl with me. I had brought a girl with me. We were dating kind of and I was like, you want to come to California with me? <laughs> but I didn't have a place to stay. <laughs> nothing and she came to california with me then when we got there i was having the time of my life the first day i was there i found a hundred dollar bill in the in the on the beach just laying there no one around nothing she's like oh this is my place and so then i buy her a fucking she thought she was gonna live there with me and i i, I didn't know what was gonna happen but i was like no nah, i don't want this i just want to be on my own so i buy her a greyhound bus ticket like four days after we leave and then i just don't talk to her again I forgot about that. Oh, I'm a dick. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. So yeah, we stopped in, but we stopped in Vegas and I lost two, 200 of my like $600. Wow. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we got to, got to California, sent her back home and then went out, start looking for a job. Yeah, that's wild. That's a, that's a trip. That's a throwback. You um, talked about a lot of the different things where they didn't maybe last a long period of time. Were you always looking for that next step or that next opportunity that kind of fulfilled something? Because you talked about like school lasted a few months or a year, went to the next thing. Did yeah, it but that's nothing. because it depends on the reason I'm doing things. Mm -hmm. If the reason I'm doing things is because someone else thinks it's a good idea for me to do, then yeah, it only lasts a little while. But I also get really obsessed with things because of, I think because of Asperger's, but 
I don't really talk about that part, but like I get really obsessed. Um, when I say I don't talk about Asperger's, it's, it's because I don't think it really matters. I think we all have something and, and who cares? You have something, it doesn't matter. The market doesn't care. You gotta perform and, and work your ass off. And who cares what label, what, if you have ADHD, anxiety, we all have something, right? So, so forget about it and just work. Anyway, um, I get really obsessed with things, especially the things I'm interested in. So like pottery, man, I could, I used to, I used to throw pots for 14 hours a day if I didn't have school or anything. And like, I would go to school early in high school. I switched high schools to be at a school with a better pottery studio. Wow. Like that was my entire life from like. I don't know. I got I, first time I did it was when I was 10, but from like the ages of 13 or 14 till I graduated high school, it was like my entire life. Um, yeah, I did a shitload of pottery. Um, but so I get obsessed. So it depends on them. Then I got really into bodybuilding uh, for about four or five years too. And so like, that's the reason I moved to California. So like, if they're very short things, if it's something that I don't really care about doing, but if it's something that I get into myself, I can get super focused and super intense on something for very long periods of time. Going back to the uh, trouble with the law, were you open about your experience with that, with your family or friends? Did they kind yeah. of, they were they supportive yeah. with everything? I mean, maybe not what you did, but in that you learned from it. Yeah, the first time, but there's that, I did more things. Um, there's, there's a current case that's going on right now. That, the thing is, is I did all this stuff in, there's just certain things that just came up now that bit me in the ass from when I was younger, but I can't say yes, no, maybe so. Cause I'm currently in a plea deal. And if I, Oh yeah. Like, you know <laughs> I, I, can't, about that. I can't talk about it. Right. So, um, so, but the, that time period when I stole the magic cards was, I did stupid shit basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, uh, and now I'm paying for it. And so because of that, like also, I mean, I think my family would help too more if I asked some, but like I'm pretty independent and I, if I get myself into something, I want to get myself out kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, I mean, yeah, they were supportive. Like they, you know, um, my dad more so than my mom. I mean, here's another, my, me and my mom don't talk at all. This I can talk about. This is another thing that happened legally that I can talk about. So I just stole like $2,000 from my mom in check, uh, out of check, um, like a signed her check or whatever, because in my fucked up head, um, I knew it wasn't her that the money would come out of because the bank refunds it from fraud. Right. And, so, and that's, and that, that is what happened. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, uh, I didn't even know I had a warrant for my arrest for like a year and a half. And I was living back in Minnesota and um, I, I had gotten pulled over. I can't remember why, but I, I anyway, I had a, the police, whatever ran my ID. They're like, Oh, you have a warrant. Oh. And uh, luckily, I, I had enough money on me. Like, this warrant was like it was from Stearns County, where I'm from. And um, I was like, what? What's it for? They looked everything up. Uh, and they, and I, mean, I was very respectful. I mean, I knew I was going to have to go get booked, but um, I, they were like super cool about it. The officer, he like told me as he was like um, putting cuffs on me and stuff to, to bring me to the station. He was just talking. He like, and he had to like, he, he had to be very careful too, because he had to count everything. Because I had, I had just come from playing poker, um, and I had like, I don't know, ten grand on me or something like that. And so he would like, you know, for his job sake too, he has to like make sure that he mm -hmm. keeps track of all that. Um, so long story short, there was, uh, I was in the the jail cell for uh, thirty minutes. And in fact, the the ladies who checked me in or whatever just let like for most of it just let me stay out while they counted my money, and they, it was three grand, so they kept three grand there for the bail and. Um, that's actually a really funny story because, so I'm six, three at the time I was about 260 pounds. I'm a little bigger than that now. Um, and so I was like, as I, we were driving there, I was like talking to the officer in the back of the car. We were talking about you know, his family and stuff, just having fun. And then, so we go down and we go like in, in this whole jail area, he takes me out and he says, put your hands on the wall. Like he takes my console, put your hand on the wall so they can like pat me down. 
And he pats me down. So I'm like, make sure I have nothing on me. Then these two young ladies come out who are, fuck, I don't know, uh, maybe 24, 25 years old, maybe 120 pounds. And he just gets in the car and leaves. And so it's me and these two girls in the room. I'm like, if I was a violent type of person, which I'm not, like, this, just seems, this just seems stupid. Like, I feel like you have to have better protocols than this, right? Because they, they're jail guards. They didn't have guns. They didn't have weapons on them. What, what the fuck? So anyway, they bring me in. And they first put me in this cell that's out by the door. And then they, they were looking at stuff. They're like, oh, that's a lot of cash. So they bring me back out to, to watch them, watch watch me count or what count. And um, so they're, they're counting the money and stuff. They're like, okay, you, you we need three grand for bail. Do you want to pay it out of this? Or do you want to stay booked and talk to a lawyer tomorrow? Because this was at night. I was like, no, <laughs> can't keep the three grand. Let me get the hell out of here, right? And um, so anyway, she, I, I, I pack all my stuff. Like after it's all done, she keeps the three and I get my stuff. I'm, my friend picked me up. Uh, my friend picked me up. I, can't, I forget which friend. Mich- Michelle, McKaylee, something like that. Um, anyway, she picked me up and I'm going through my stuff again. And I find a slip of paper with this jail guard's fucking phone number on it. <laughs> what the hell? So literally a week later, I take her out to dinner. The, the jail guard who just literally booked me into jail, even though I didn't stay any time there. It was just freaking, it's funny as hell, <laughs> but um, yeah, so that was the, the other, um, other legal thing that had, um, so long story short, same thing because that actually happened before the magic cards, the, it was the same prosecutor. He was like, well, it looks like this happened before. And ever since then, you've been good. Like I haven't, I've had no other, no other issues with the law. I haven't done anything else. So he's like, because it looks like you're trying to make your life better. You're not, there isn't, this isn't actually another crime committed since the last one, right? It actually, the date of the crime happened prior. And so he was like, he was like, yeah, pay the restitution. You got to pay the court fees and you got to do a little more community service. It's like, okay, fine. Do that. Um, yeah. So it was crazy. It looking at the whole journey with law has it taught you anything about yourself sometimes like sometimes if people spend time in jail they come out learning something new about themselves well so i haven't really spent time in jail i did once in canada spend five days in jail for not committing any crime but because i had those priors i was deemed inadmissible to to canada and the guard let me in i didn't lie at the, the gate or anything but because the guard in Canada fucked up and wasn't supposed to let me in, I was deemed inadmissible and then arrested, put in jail for five days. It was Thursday at night, so I had to stay Thursday night. Then Friday, had to stay, the judge couldn't see me, so then I stayed the weekend. Tuesday, I still didn't get seen, so I got a lawyer because I was like, I don't know what's going on, but I should have seen a judge and been released already because I wasn't charged with a crime. It was an immigration hold. So Tuesday, I see a judge after paying a lawyer like 4000 Canadian, like, I don't know, 3200 bucks, And... Um, th- and he was like, why has this guy still been in jail this whole time? The prosecuting attorney said, well, he has priors. He could be a threat to our society. He's like, that's not all. Uh, you can't just keep him in jail for that. He was like, because the this prosecutor there for the immigration officer was trying to get me to have to stay 30 days in the jail before they sent me back to like never releasing. And I was just like, hell no. He can have a supervised release meeting. I had to text a number every morning when I woke up and I have 30 days to leave the country. And I and then text someone and back in the country, back in the US. And so that's the only actual time I spent in jail, which actually was very hard because it was during COVID, oh. during lockdowns, which meant complete solitary. And on top of that, I didn't actually do anything. Like there was no ch- crime. And it wasn't even, it's not like I lied to get into Canada. The person, let, I, I said, they said, can I have your passport, your ID, all that. So I kept, here's my passport, my driver's license, all that kind of stuff. All the documents I asked for, look over everything. They sent me in. Like, how is this my fault? <laughs> so that was hard, but no, uh, you know, I, what I will say that I think it's taught me, cause I, first of all, it taught me that I hate jail. So to be a good boy, right. <laughs> terrified of that. But I think the, the part about the thing that it's taught me as far as business goes is that this is going to sound bad, but I think there's real value in, in business, especially when you grow as quickly as we have at true Zenith creative um 
there's always going to be fires. But what it, what having to go through the court systems teaches you is to perform under stress, keep a level head, and put those fire fires out as they come. Right? Mm-hmm. We want to plan as much as we can, but there's all, especially when we're growing. I mean, we went from so I've been doing freelance this stuff since last June, June of 2021. But I did it only by myself for, for the first year. So June of 2021 till June of 2022. July of 2022 is the first time I hired employees. So from July of 2022 till now, I have 24 employees now. Um, I just hired my first sales guys finally. They started this week. Up until this point, I've been um, doing over 50K a month by myself. And now we're going to break 300K by next March, by the coming March with the five guys. And um, so I think one of the things that it's taught me is that fires are going to come, but no matter what, you, getting upset or getting emotional or being scared or crying or any of the other stuff, keeping a level head and thinking about each piece logically is going to give you the best results. No, I like that because that same concept, so many people can utilize. I think at any time when they're going through something that comes out of nowhere, a fire, like you said, or struggles, they start overthinking, freaking out, not thinking logically, like you said. But I feel that if you're able to overcome those obstacles, you become stronger on the other side and you're able to prepare if that does happen again, because you've just gone through it. So that same concept, you can see that with athletes, you can see that with business professionals, freelancers like yourself, people in all different industries can utilize. I'm not a freelancer anymore. Well, no, no, no. I'm just saying, I'm just saying in general freelancers, because in my business, I work with independent contractors and they go through the same thing in situations where things come out of nowhere and they have to think ahead or think logically and things like that. So I'm saying like anyone can utilize that same concept. Yes, absolutely. 100%. Oh, excuse me. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think it's super important because I think emotional thinking, and this makes me sound cold, but emotional thinking, there is no benefit, at least not in a business and making money sense. There's, There's no benefit to emotional thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also think that, okay, I'm for, as far as like masculinity goes, I'm more traditional. And I think that as a man, my role, at least for me, I don't care what other people do, but for me, my role is to provide. And I think that in order to provide emotion, doesn't come into play. What comes into play is being calculating and doing the things that need to get done. And so I used to be really emotional, but now I make it a point to, even if I feel sad, feel depressed or feel happy or feel angry, it doesn't matter what I feel on the inside, my actions day to day are going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that for me as a man trying to provide, I think it's the more, and I'm not perfect at that. It doesn't always happen, but I, that's something I think about and I'm very conscientious of is to be very calculated in everything I do. One of the titles in your company's name is creative. What do you specialize creatively when you're working with clients? Well, that's a, that is a loaded question and a great question. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so right now we're very technical focused, actually. Um, we built a, a huge majority of our um, revenue comes from web development and um, SEO, which is search engine optimization. The reason creative is important to me is because financial goals and like revenue milestones are important, but something that's also a huge goal of mine with this company is to someday be big enough where we're doing Super Bowl commercials. Okay. Um, and so in the video, I've always been a fan of video and that kind of stuff. And so um, that's where the creative comes in. And because art has always been something close to my heart ever since I was a kid. And so right now we're not doing a ton of create like super creative stuff. Um, but it's something that's in the company business plan for down the road. Um, the benefit with what we're doing now is just cash flows much faster. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, when you mentioned pottery earlier in the interview, and I think when I saw creative for the first time in your brandy, it's like, I can see the connection because with pottery, 
you're artistic, you're coming up with a creative project. And what you're doing now is you're utilizing that skill, that love, that passion for creative mindset and utilizing it in a different format that is what's big nowadays, which is the technology part. Yep, that's exactly right. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I've always been a computer tech guy. Uh, so the other thing I did a lot of, uh, so for whatever reason, I've been really drawn to 3D stuff, pottery, 3D art, mm -hmm. not painting, right? But I've also been doing, since I was a kid, since I was about the same age, 12 or 13, doing um, 3D modeling and like animation character renderings. Because um, I've always kind of also wanted to make my own video game. So I'd like create fantasy characters. Because, well, like I said, Magic the Gathering. Like I'm a huge, at heart, a huge Star Wars fan. I've got a big ass painting of um, Darth Vader, all but very creative, like um, like Technicolored. Darth Vader, mm -hmm. um, like I love Lord of the Rings. I love anything fantasy. I played Magic the Gathering. I, I played D&D, &D, man. Like I was a, <laughs> a huge nerd. You talked about Super Bowl commercials would be that dream. Is there a certain client that no. or, you, you're willing to work with anyone that you're able to for the most part? Well, in that capacity for the Super Bowl stuff, yes. There are clients that I won't work with now because we have like, for, for example, for digital marketing, we do a positive ROAS guarantee return on ad spend. So for me to work with you, I have to see that you have a product that I think I can sell. Because if I can't, then I'm just going to have to give you your money back anyway. So. With being someone that, where there's maybe competition, how do you get yourself out there? Oh, because I absolutely love competition. Dude, <laughs> listen, my, my motto on business is, is old school. It's not this Gary V bullshit of, oh, we're all one life. Dude, if you're in my industry, if you're a creative or marketing agency, my goal is to put you out of business or buy you. To, ideally, it's to devalue your business enough to the point where I can buy you for pennies on the dollar is what I would have last year. Wow. <laughs> so that what gets me out of bed is the competition. What, what, what drives me to get myself my, to do these podcasts, to, to get my brand out there as much as possible as possible is I want to win. And, and the other thing is, is from a business, just not even just this business, because this is all, this is one business, but there's going to be many others going forward. And from a business perspective, like money is the scoring stick right mm -hmm. after after a certain amount of money which i'm not there but like if you think about it after say 20 30 million dollars right maybe 100 million if you want to jet after that money loses most of its utilitarian purpose which i'm a long ways from that but if you think about it there's still people that are driven after that mm -hmm. right? people make a lot more money than 100 million and so the way i think about it like i think i'm a piece of shit i've done nothing because there's guys like Elon Musk out there. There's guys like Alex Ramosi out there. There's guys that are absolutely destroying me in the business realm. And we, we score that in business by the amount of dollars you make, right? And so while, yeah, I make a shitload of money in my business compared to maybe what the average amount, you know, I make more in a month at this business as far as revenue goes than most people do in a year of work. But when you're talking about business, my business is nothing. So that's what gets me out of bed is it's the competition that, that I fucking suck right now. And I got to get better to beat these guys. It, that's such a good mentality you have. I, I mean, if someone's listening and thinks, oh, that's like, he wants to beat the competition. Any person, you look at an athlete, they're trying to win. They're going to go beat the competition. Someone that's doing like other business adventures, they're doing the same thing. That is such a great you're willing to put in the work, get up early, go do it, enjoy what you're doing, but also try to expand and grow. You're at that age where you got a lot to look forward to. Well, and let me be clear. I don't think that people who don't have this mindset are any less than me. That's not what I'm saying. For the vast majority of people, what I'm saying doesn't apply because if you're wanting to go work in an existing company, don't listen to this mindset. You know, I think that I think everyone could do with a little bit more competitiveness, mm -hmm. right? But when, when people, when you're looking at it for me, you have to look at it through the lens of I'm stepping into a competitive arena and the top players in this industry, they want to do the same thing. Freaking Facebook and, you know, Facebook's a different industry, but they do the same thing. They acquire other companies or they try to put them out of business if they can't be acquired, right? 
No, there's always people who shine through like Snapchat got through, they refused to sell, but it's very hard. And so in order, in order to make it where I want to get, I don't want to stay a small business. People are like, oh, small business is the backbone of America. And, and it's true, but that's just not what I want. Mm-hmm. Right. And so um, in order for me to make my goals, I have to be like that. And it's scary in a sense, because more than likely I'm going to fail right? Like the data would show that's almost impossible to do, right? Starting from nothing. When I started this business, I had a computer at maybe 300 to $500 to my name. And so there's, there's no reason, there's no reason that I should think I can be successful at this. And maybe I won't, but I'll tell you what, it's not going to be because of lack of effort. And Mm -hmm. the only way for me to succeed is I have to be ruthlessly competitive. We've looked at your journey, but sometimes our guests, lo- our listeners love to learn more about the individual. Do you have a personal goal that you have for yourself in the next few years? Not in the professional uh, standpoint, but a personal, like, do you want to travel somewhere or something like that? Well, I don't know. If it, well, let me ask you if this is what you mean. One thing that I want within the next few years is I want a small private jet, like a Honda jet. Okay. Um, as far as travel more, no. I plan to work every single day, seven days a week for the next few years. What's so special uh, about that jet? It doesn't have to be a Honda jet. It has to be a jet of some kind. Uh, of like, I would love to be a bigger jet. I just don't think that I'll be, a, maybe I will. But a Honda jet, brand new is about five mil. Um, you can get them <laughs> used for about two. Um, and I think I can do that. So I think that that's a hard goal, but unattainable one at the same time. Um, so, and I'm not saying I'll buy it new, very well, we'll probably buy it used, (laughs) but the reason is, is because once I can unlock that and be able to go where I want to buy real estate, to do business at a, at a moment's notice, and I'm, I'm no longer tied, right. I I have a chauffeur now and it's the best money I spend. As far as any employee goes, it's the best money I spend because now every single second from this time I wake up. I'm working. I'm working in the back of this. I'm working in the back of the car while he's taking me to work. I'm working it. When I leave here after this podcast, he's got to drive me. I got to go do some things. I'm working. I can send him to go get me things so I can stay at the office and work, right? Like it's hands down. When you start making money, you should be paying people to free up more of your time. You're buying back your time. So you can, I can put my money back into higher value tasks. Interesting. And now I can see, cause you talked about, you're looking at towards the future, like investment yes. or the future work that you're going to be done, which nowadays everyone's trying to get into that realm in some way, because they're always looking at how they can make even more so that they can get more or va- value more and things like that. When did you start falling in love with like wanting to do investments in real estate when you eventually get to that moment? I wouldn't say I fall in love with it. I would say that it's just a, it's something that's going to happen as I, if I get to the point where I'm buying, buying a private jet, I should probably have some hard assets like real estate. I think that's just kind of part of it. Right. But it's also to meet clients, right? It's also cause I, my office, my development office is down in Mexico. And so, but all my clients are in the U S so it's, it's to be able to fly back and forth to meet clients whenever I want the client, you know, if a client says, uh, cause right now we're selling packages that are uh, like 50 grand or more. So mm-hmm. by that time, there will be packages probably that at a half a million to a million dollar mark because we're raising our prices every three months because, because we're getting too much business and we have to. And so um, if I have a client who's like, yeah, you know, I'm not sure. And I say, yeah, okay. Then let's say they're in LA and I'll say, and they're like, yeah, I'm just not sure. Whatever. I was like, okay, well, let's go for dinner tonight and, and see. And they're like, well, well you're in Mexico. Yeah, no problem, man. I'll be there. I'll pick you up at, you know, eight o'clock. Hop on my jet, go, boom. That day that sale gets closed, right? Mm-hmm. Where otherwise it might not have. And so that, that's why, because it, it just allows me to become completely, now I'm completely free at that point. Looking at your whole journey, what's the biggest thing you've learned? Give me a minute. You're good. Big time. <laughs> The biggest, that is a loaded question too. The biggest thing I've learned out of my whole journey
I would say, I would say it's in two parts. Okay. People vast, if you're trying to get where I'm trying to get, people vastly underestimate the necessities of incredible hardship and the necessities of competition. So this whole thing about everyone deserves a, a participation trophy in my mind and it's bullshit. My kids are not going to participate in that. Um, you have to lose because if you don't lose, you won't appreciate when you win. Mm -hmm. So the first part is that the second part is people have no idea the amount of work that it takes. I work 18 hours a day, seven days a week. At the minimum I work is 15 hours a day. Um, and the reason you can get to this level without doing that, but if you really want to break through and get to, to the level that some of these people are at, every single one of them, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, all of them, they all work like that. At Elon Musk, same thing. And so it's, an, it's not healthy, it's not recommended, but if you want to get to that level, it's a necessity. And I think too that doing it, even, man, if force yourself to do it for a month and just see how you feel about it, because if you, even if you do it for a month, the amount you're going to accomplish is absolutely insane. Yep. So hard work, people undervalue two things, hard work and competitiveness. And every, every, time, every time I think about that, I focus on taking my competitiveness up another degree and my work ethic up another degree and try to push those boundaries. The final question I'll ask you, for someone that's listening to this interview based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals, and rise to the challenge? When you're going through something really hard, just tell you, you're not going to believe it the first time you tell yourself this. When you're going through the shit and the mud, tell yourself that this is what will make you better later this will make my life better later and then once you get through it replay those things in your head so you remember it but if you can tell yourself that while you're going through the shit while you're homeless while you're while your significant other is is hitting you while what whatever might be happening if you can tell yourself that this is a good thing because long term it will make me a better person and you, and you don't let it toxify your life and you come out on top, if you can think about it while it's happening and take responsibility, man, your life will change. Well, Jack, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. You're inspiring so many people and we're excited to see what the future looks like for you. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate being here. It was, uh, it was a fun podcast for sure.